Fear Not, Episode 81. Hi, I'm Billy Atwell, and I believe that consistently facing your fears is the only way to realize your truest self and to make those confident choices that will help you to obtain your deepest held hopes and dreams. I have faith that this podcast series will show you that you are not alone, that it will strengthen you and give you courage to face your fears, and that it will help you to permanently cross over into a life of living beyond your fears. Join me on this journey as we listen and learn from others as they share their experiences in facing and overcoming their own fears. The legendary Patty Palmer spent over three decades developing the Palmer plush tissue fitting method. This technique allows you to create clothes that fit your body rather than rigidly adhering to the pattern's contours. Palmer plush fitting workshops and online courses are designed for both the beginner and advanced sewist and provides a polished piece that looks custom made. For more information on the available Palmer plush fitting workshops and online courses, visit palmerplush.com. P-A-L-M-E-R-P-L-E-T-S-C-H dot com. Hello, everybody. Today, you and I are going to be joined by Bob Litwin. Hey, Bob, how are you doing today? Hey, Billy. Thanks for having me on. Thank you. Are you ready to fear not today? I am definitely ready to fear not. Performance coach and author Bob Litwin has spent over three decades using the new story method to coach thousands of top athletes, performance coaches, and Wall Street hedge funds and traders to raise individual performance to extraordinary levels. He is the number one world-ranked senior tennis player, two-time world tennis champion, 18-time U.S. national champion, and the first non-tour player to be inducted in the Eastern Hall of Fame. His book, Live the Best Story of Your Life, A World Champion's Guide to Lasting Change, has been an Amazon bestseller since its May 2016 release. Bob, can you take a few moments to fill in the gaps and maybe also give us an additional brief glimpse of your personal life? Sure. Well, all of this uh, work that I've been doing for years started off by me being a tennis pro, local tennis, cl- you know, at a club, basically, where um, it was a kind of low self-esteem job. It was a great job. It was fun. But I felt a lot smaller than the people that I was teaching, and especially since I had, was brought up in a town where I was supposed to probably be a lawyer or a doctor or work on Wall Street. And here I was now working at a club, giving lessons to my high school friends who were now lawyers and doctors and Wall Streeters. And one day I, I was feeling uncomfortable with my work. Uh, it happened to be on um, actually Father's Day. And I was running a parent-child tournament. Of course, the pros kids could come and play if there was room, but there wasn't room. And I just felt really awful and just thought, this is not the right business for me. And I basically did what I had done many times in my life already, which was I decided to change my story about my work. And I realized that actually, even though I was teaching tennis, here I was teaching people who seemed to be more vertically successful than me, or at least in my interpretation, I was teaching them life skills and all of the stuff that I would say six, seven hours a day teaching tennis that was not related to technique or strategy was information about life. Most of it was not that profound, like being more positive, relaxing under pressure, facing self-perceived fears, you name it. And I realized, wait, I am absolutely teaching these people who know a lot about certain things. They don't know very much about this other stuff. So progressively, I went from teaching mental skills in tennis, I started working with athletes in sports of which I had minimal knowledge, and thought like, actually, it's better to not be involved in the technique and strategy of those people I'm working with. If I were good at uh, golf, I'd be a golfer. But I went from tennis to other sports. I did some work for the Knicks, New York Knicks, and for the New York Islanders. And I, I, I said yes to everything before I was even ready. And after a while, I created a seminar program called the Focus Game Seminar. And the people that would come to it would be business people looking to shave a stroke off their handicap or looking to win their club championship in tennis or play better. And they would say, boy, this, has, this is really similar to work stuff. Will you come and talk to my team? But I really was not 
ready to do that. But I would work with individuals. And one thing led to another. And about 12 years ago, I was approached by a hedge fund in New York City. And they said, we're looking for a performance coach. Do you know anybody? And I didn't. And they basically convinced me to come. And I went there that first day and I thought, this is what what my work is, to help people who are already really good at something get better. And uh, that's pretty much what I've been doing for the last 12 years. I still work with athletes, collegiate, professional athletes. And and during this whole time, I was like many other coaches, I was re- a reactive coach. Like somebody would say something and I would say something back to them. But then I had gone through a difficult period in my life where I had lost my wife, I had some hip surgeries. It looked like I wasn't going to play tennis again. And my daughter said, it's time. Write the book. And I had been writing a lot. And I was like, I, I, write a book? I don't know. I can write blasts, but I can't write a whole book. And I spent five years working on a book, which made me a much better version of myself because I needed to be really clear about what I was doing, how I was doing it, And basically, I was giving my system to the world if they wanted it for them to be able to make the changes they might want to make in their lives. So I feel very blessed. I I mean, I've had many incarnations and who I am now is uh, a better version of who I was before. And that was better than before that. That sounds amazing. And and thank you so much for sharing. Um, Bob, would you also share with us today one of the biggest fears you've had to face? Well, you know, I knew you were going to ask me that question, and I'm sure like the other people that you interview, you know, people think about that, and I'm a counter-narrative person, basically. I've done a lot of things that seem to go against the grain, and I don't mean to be counter-narrative, but as I was thinking about it, I was thinking like, hmm, fear, fear. So... I thought about most recently, I was at the Grand Canyon a couple of weeks ago, and I remember I had... I was fearful, I'm not sure if fear and fearful are the same, but you probably would have more to say about that than I would, but I was fearful that my wife or I or somebody could fall. It was a real, I wasn't scared where I was like, I gotta get out of here, but I was fearful in a way that I was particularly cautious and stayed much more focused than I might have been doing a hike. I live in Colorado, so, I do a lot of hiking, but I was very cautious because it's a mile down. I mean, you fall, you're done. So I was thinking, well, okay, what else had that same feeling for me? And I really, I, you know, when I start to think, you know, I lost my wife to cancer and I didn't really fear, that word didn't seem to resonate for me. So I don't really feel very much fear, but I guess some similar definition would be I, when there's unknown in front of me, I have certain feelings that might be similar to fearful feelings. So, you know, what was going to happen after my wife died or what was going to happen after they did my second hip surgery? Um, would I be able to compete again? Or um, the unknown of walking into a hedge fund But I never, I mean, as an athlete, I guess I've trained fear out. So maybe I'm eliminating a large part of my life when I was younger where I probably did feel fear, whether it was the fear of the monster under the bed. But somehow I don't don't have a lot of memories of of that. Um, So I've pushed through things that other people might say, you must have had a lot of fear. But I I would say that it's not something that I've really been able to, identify all that clearly. I hope that's not a problem. Yeah, Um, no. Maybe you could explain to us how you face the unknown and how you get to the other side so that you're not backing away from a challenge or anything like that. That might be interesting for us to know. Yeah, sure. Well, I guess one one of the areas of my life that might have fallen into the category of fear was I had lived in New York for my whole life on Long Island. And um, about three years ago, four years ago, I had gotten remarried and I started to get this feeling that I wanted to live somewhere else. And I knew that Colorado was the place because one of my daughters is here with two, three of my grandchildren. Um, 
And she had been out here through college. So I had been coming back and forth from Colorado a lot. So here I have got this amazing job at this hedge fund in particular, which uh, made my life very, very comfortable. And I knew I wanted to move, but I was not able to just kind of make the decision. And a lot of it had to do with money because I felt I'd have to give up the money that I was making there. And I'd be going to Colorado and didn't really know how I would basically, if I needed to replenish those dollars, what was I going to do? So I was getting an acupuncture treatment and I was kind of spacing out in the treatment. I was thinking like, unknown. This is an unknown. That's what this is about for me. And generally, I welcome the unknown because none of it is really all that terrible. Um, so there was a shift in that moment that was related, of course, to getting work done. And I was very open to my own understanding of things. And I thought, oh, I welcome the unknown. And it's very similar to the fact that I run towards adversity. As an athlete, you have to. And every time you play a tennis match, it's always an unknown. There are no guarantees. Whether you're the better player or not, you don't know what's going to happen. So to deal with making those changes that are big, one piece of it for me is to welcome the unknown, to not push back against it, like, but what's going to happen? What's going to happen? So that was one thing. And then another thing that occurred during this process was I had been doing a seminar, a presentation at an event about Live the Best Story. It happened to be a tennis function. And the people in the room were saying, like, all right, so you want us to write our old story, a new story. What's your story? It's like, oh, okay. Well, my story is that I'm going to be moving to Colorado. That was like the action part of my story. And they said, well, but you said that last year when you were here. I said, all right, all right, fine. So I'm not moving forward on it that well. And as I was talking about it with this group of people, I said, the big thing, though, for me is that I'm not trusting that things will work out. Things have worked out in my life over and over and over again, despite the fact that there have been a lot of holes that I've stepped into. But here I am at age 65, living an incredible life. Why would I think that I can't trust that I'll figure things out? So trust and welcome the, welcoming the unknown were big factors for me in making the, sh the big jumps in my life, whether it was from going from tennis to Wall Street, whether it was going from losing my wife to the next part of my life, moving from New York, giving up everything I had there in a sense to go to Colorado. And of course, the interesting thing is that when I went to the particular hedge fund that where I had been working for many years, I pretty much said, yeah, I'm willing to give it up. And the person kept saying to me, like, you, you really, you'd give it up? I said, well, I'm having this conversation with you. And of course, what happened three weeks later, he came back to me and said, we still want you. Will you come back to New York every other week for two days? So by letting go of the, what might be perceived as fear, the good stuff came back to me, the trust. And I really trust in the universe. I really do. I mean, uh, despite the fact that there have been some difficult things in my life, I still trust that I'm going to be okay. Life will be all right. And it turned out to be that because I'm living another great story of my life right now, looking out my window at the Rockies. Yeah, it sounds, it sounds pretty amazing. Um, yeah, it is. Here I am in the, in the Rockies, and I do work with my clients on Skype and on the phone and sitting in the hot tub, which is something that many, many years ago, I heard Tony Robbins talk about how he was sitting in his hot tub in Hawaii, and he was on the phone with various, like, uh, famous people, and I thought, oh, I like that idea, sitting in a hot tub and coaching. That's what I want to do. So that was out in front of me, and now here I am doing it. I know that you've mentioned that being an athlete has sort of helped to condition you with this mindset. Have there been other resources that you've come across uh, at various points of your life that have also helped you to develop this approach? Well, I've been very lucky to either know closely or at least know through reading a book, unbelievable teachers. Um, 
and like I say, some of them are people that I've never met. But as as a tennis coach, when I was in my 30s, I was reading a lot about what I guess now would be called performance. And those, whether it was Mahali, Sizik Mahali, who wrote Flow, or Tony Robbins' book, his original Awaken the Giant Within, or um, Dr. Jim Lair, who was basically the first sports psychologist who wrote some incredible books about mental training, these were my teachers. And then as I became somewhat more recognized in the field, these people became, some of them became my friends and they became my mentors. And even Dr. Lair, who I've often said, Jim, you're my mentor. He's like, no, 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 I'm not your mentor. You're the person who did everything I said that you ought to do. You, you were the experiment. Because I went from not being a very good tennis player to winning the world championships. And it was a shocking development over 20 years that I was able to do it. But that's because I listened to my teachers. Stephen Covey was another one that had a huge influence on me. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People was a life changer for me. And then most recently, I would say that the biggest influence in the way in which I think about things is Eckhart Tolle. And when I first read The Power of Now, which was really popular with athletes, it just didn't resonate for me. But several years later, when Carol got sick, and uh, then at the same time, my first grandchild was born three months premature, it was a tough time. And I picked up uh, A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle, and it just spoke to me. It spoke to me about ego. It spoke to me about presence and just deepened my understanding of the work that I needed to be doing on this earth. I mean, my personal work. Are you ready for the speed run? Sure. What person, whether they be fiction or real, has made the most impact on your life? Well, the person who... My wife, Carol, made the biggest impact because when I met her, she seemed to love me for who I was at a time in my life where I didn't love myself for who I was. And it was confusing for me. Like, you love me? Just, you, you, you don't know me well enough then. So, so that relationship was one where she really helped me grow by helping me accept who I am and that I was a good person that deserved love. Um, so she was huge. And now I have another angel like that in my life, Joanne, who I'm married to now, who basically, she kind of threw me on my back, on her back and took me to places where Carol might not have been able to. Um, so definitely a big influence in my life. But interestingly, you know, in terms of going back to fear and, you know, like, or courage, is courage the flip, flip side of fear, do you think? Really? I've heard it say where um, courage is not the absence of fear, but it's just proceeding in spite of it. Oh, okay. So I've been inspired by fictional characters like Reacher. Like Jack, Jack Reacher, that guy is like, I want to be Reacher. The guy is, is free of, of concerns. I mean, he's a fictional character, but I've always felt like fictional characters are still coming from somewhere, from, from Lee Childs. He, he might be that person. So uh, in my book, I, I wrote about Reacher, and people were like, but he's not real. But he still inspired me. He has inspired me. Um, so I, I would say that there's my fictional character and my real-life character, and there are also a group of people that I've played tennis with. I've been playing senior tennis since it starts at the age of 35, and you play in your age group. Every five years, you're in a new, new age group. And what I found is the very best players in the world, uh, this is not the same as Federer and these guys, because these are all you know getting older. The very best players in the world are amazing people, and they demonstrate it in the way in which they go into competition, the way they're okay at, at, they can take a loss, 
they recognize their inability to be perfect and they they're able to be okay within their own skin which whether you know tennis or not if you know about Roger Federer here's a guy who's 35 years old who's now after being out of the game for 6 months he's found bliss and he can't he's just beating everybody again when he's supposed to be finished and part of that is he seems so comfortable in his own skin he's good with who he is so athletes have been big for me too if you could instantly change one thing in the world what would you change i would change the way people think about what story people are telling themselves about change i think that people think that change is painful hard takes a long time and doesn't last and i think that's a story that we've been sold by the therapeutic community, not with bad intention, but like going all the way back to the earlier days of Freud. And I think that uh, I just have a different story about change. And that's, that's the message that I give people. I don't tell people what to do. I just say, you've got to try a different story about change. It's fun. It's exciting. It's dynamic. It's a reason to live. It's a reason to get up every day. It doesn't have to take a long time. People shift their emotions in a moment. People can shift the way they think about things in a moment. And if it doesn't last forever, that's okay, because whatever you did to make the change initially, you can do it again. And we really are, we are in charge of who we are in the present moment. The past really doesn't have that big an impact on us if we are in that state of presence. And uh, I'd love to to see a change in the world about the way people think about change. People stay stuck for a long time because of the fact that they think it's like, I can't change that. I've always been this way. What's your biggest weakness? Oh, I want to tell my story too much and don't listen as well as I might. I think that that that's a, that's something that I keep working on in my life. I feel I have a lot to say. So that sometimes blocks me from listening, but I'm actually a good listener. It's just that I'm also wanting to teach a lot. Um, so I think that that and the fact that I've still am trying to like let go of ego. I was doing great when I moved to Colorado and this book came out and that was like another ego thing. Like, oh, my God, I'm an author. Oh, my God, it's like I'm selling books. So, so I had done a lot to work on freeing myself up of ego, although I'm sure I will never get totally there. So now I'm in a state right now where I'm letting go again of this book and uh, just letting things be, being myself. What's your biggest strength? Um, I think that I have humility about the information that comes through me. I, I don't know where, it, I, I guess it comes from me, but everything it seems that I'm doing with people, it just automatically flows through me. And instead of me trying to turn it into something like a program per se, even though I do have a program, it's that I trust that something about that's bigger than me has said, look, open your mouth, we'll take care of the words. And I think that, again, it was part of letting go of ego, thinking that I was smart or something, to, to be okay with the fact that I don't even know where so much of the information comes from. Yep. I think that's a strength of mine. Do you have a favorite sound? 